Howdy once again, YouTube. My name is Ben Ferriolo. First off, if this video or intro is too long for you, then please skip to a part that interests you by utilizing the parts section in the description box below. Please like, share, especially share if you want because that helps me get a little more viewers, and subscribe if you like my work. Also, please visit my website. It contains an amazing amount of information. It can show you how to find seismic data, how to analyze it, with what programs to analyze it with, and much more. It even shows you earthquake examples and hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots pertaining to many earthquake swarms and events. There is also a link to it in the description box below, right under my email address. I keep adding new content, so check back every once in a while. This is the monthly volcano report for January 2019. I know this is very late, guys. Sorry about that. But I have been very busy lately, and this update is finally finished. The reported earthquake counts that I state are taken directly from the United States Geological Survey and their partners and are only earthquakes reported, not earthquakes recorded. In regards to earthquake counts, it is likely the majority of the time that the reported earthquake total for a given location and time period, most especially during a swarm, is lower than the actual count of earthquakes in some cases drastically lower. This has to do with the multitude of factors, including inability to locate, lack of instruments, and many other reasons that, to be honest, make no sense, especially when many of the earthquakes are obviously able to be recorded. So, I don't know. You can especially see this on my new Yellowstone Rapid Fire Earthquake Swarm page, link below as well. It is my goal to eventually major in seismology and also study volcanology, but I do believe I am properly equipped to give you guys a heads up if anything concerning may occur at volcanoes throughout the United States. States. I am pretty familiar with precursor seismic events uh, that happened prior six months to five years before a volcanic eruption, so I am pretty familiar with many, many precursor events. So, remember, most earthquake swarms at volcanoes do not lead to eruptions, but almost every eruption is preceded by a swarm. Funny how that works, huh? That is why earthquake swarms should always be monitored closely, especially ones that are underreported but clearly show hundreds of events. The volcanoes I will be doing monthly and yearly updates on will be Yellowstone Supervolcano in Wyoming, Long Valley Supervolcano in California, Newberry Caldera and Mount Hood in Oregon, Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens in Washington State, and Mount Shasta and Lassen Peak Volcanic Center in California. Glacier Peak, a volcano that is closest to me and is about 50 miles or so east of me, has no monitoring inst instruments, excuse me, except one sometimes faulty seismograph. The Pacific Northwest Seismic Network is putting new instruments there soon, hopefully, and Glacier Peak will be added to the updates once monitor installation has been completed. In this video and other updates, we will look at earthquake and deformation counts. The time period of the reported earthquake counts for this video, derived from the USGS Earthquake Catalog, is from 0 UTC, January 1st, 2019, to 2359 UTC, January 31st, 2019, and magnitudes are always going to be negative 0.5 and above, so you will see every single reported earthquake for this time period in general location. And by the way, guys, yes, earthquakes can occur at negative magnitudes, but they require sensitive seismographs to accurately locate. Thank God, many of the seismographs that are out there right now are sensitive enough for that, but it's good to have a dense seismic array around every single volcano. I like to call these negative earthquakes micro minis. Every month's update will be uploaded about five days or so after the month in question has ended. Sorry again for taking so long on this, guys. Also, in regards to the three pod images I generate for the largest earth reported earthquake for each volcano, I will always try my best to use the closest seismic station to any given event. As always, let's start with Yellowstone. Here we are at Yellowstone. There have been 92 reported earthquake events for the month of January 2019, although this count is off most likely accurately being around 170 or so, this month did carry a little bit lower seismicity counts than, than uh, December 2018 did. December 2018 actually saw some a good amount of rapid fire swarms, guys. It was pretty interesting, especially the one that occurred on December 31st, 2018. That one was pretty crazy. Now, there was a swarm that occurred in this location right here. Let me try to zoom in and see if that's the same swarm. Turn on terrain. Let's see, right outside the caldera, Amethyst Mountain. There is Amethyst Mountain right there. Okay, so this swarm that you see right here occurred on the same day, January 6th, 2019, and occurred just south of Amethyst Mountain and just northeast of Yellowstone Lake, just barely outside of the caldera boundary. This earthquake swarm 
was pretty strong. Magnitude 2.8, 2.8, 2.6, 2.6. There were a few unreported events, but the count was actually kind of low. There were about 14 or 15 events within, what, like 20 minutes or so? But still, it was very interesting, guys. Very interesting. Then, we have a few other events spread throughout the area. Nothing too, too major at all. Let's see if I can zoom out. There we go. So, we had a few up here. And then a few did occur near the December 31st, 2018 swarm epicenter, which is right about in this area right here, but not really any other swarming. And then we did have some swarming down here as well with some seismicity, of course, near the Maple Creek and Hebgen Lake area near Holmes Hill, somewhat near Norris, actually. And then down south, we had some interesting seismicity south of Maple Creek. Now, this earthquake swarm right here near Amethyst Mountain was actually documented by myself on this blog post here. Under the Seismic Events drop-down menu, click Yellowstone Supervolcano, and you'll see it says January 6, 2019. Although the amount of earthquakes was not great, the magnitudes were quite strong, and it also occurred in a location that rarely ever sees earthquake swarms. Also, the frequencies of these events were a little bit lower than what you would expect. They were very interesting, very strong, very peculiar waveforms, too. I don't know what was going on here. I'm glad it didn't last even longer, because then I'd be very concerned, but it didn't last that long, so... Then there was another earthquake swarm, also characterized as a rapid-fire swarm, that occurred in a strange location. Look, we have two swarm locations up here near Amethyst Mountain, which is a strange location, and down here as well, near Shoshone and Lewis Lake at Yellowstone. Very odd spot. This earthquake swarm struck on January 23rd, 2019, and was another rapid fire swarm with a couple good sized events. I again have detailed this swarm on this post here, so check out the description box below for the link, or simply go to my website, hover over the seismic events drop down menu, and click Yellowstone Supervolcano. Actually, the largest reported event for the whole month of January 2019 came from this swarm here. And I believe this was, yep, this is the 3.0, the largest event at Yellowstone during the month of January. Also, here we are in my Steamboat Geyser 2019 page on my website. Now, Steamboat Geyser and the Norris Geyser Basin erupted three times during January 2019, and then erupted a fourth time on February 1st, and a fifth time on February 9th, 2019. Altogether, since it reactivated in early 2018, there have been 37 eruptions. Now again, this is the Steamboat 2019 page, so once again, check the description box below, or just go to my website and simply go to the Seismic Events drop-down menu, click Steamboat Geyser 2019, and also don't forget to check out Steamboat Geyser 2018, which shows every single plot and every single eruption for every single seismic image, or sorry, for every single eruption, for all of the eruptions in 2018. Yeah, kind of tripped over my words there. For the Yellowstone Supervolcanic Complex, the largest earthquake to occur within the month of January 2019 was a magnitude 3.0 and 9.4 kilometers in depth, with a which actually struck during a rapid-fire swarm on January 23rd, 2019, right down here in between Lewis Lake and Shoshone Lake. Actually, it was a little bit closer to Lewis Lake, but this is very far south to see a rapid-fire swarm. But if you do see on my page, the blog post that I showed you detailing the January 23rd swarm, you will see that it, you have to go all the way back to November 25th, 2016, I believe. November 25th, 2016 is where you have to go back to to even see a swarm in this area at all. Yes, it's happened before, but it's been many years, guys. And yeah, guys, there are many lakes at Yellowstone. Look at this. Hebgen Lake. I don't know what this one's called. Is that an Earthquake Lake? No way. I think Earthquake Lake is up here, actually. I, I forget. But here's Shoshone Lake, Lewis Lake, forget what that one's called. And we have Yellowstone Lake right here and West Thumb Lake right here. Lots of lakes, guys. Surprisingly, nobody felt this earthquake, but it was still quite strong. For your convenience, here are the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots for the largest earthquake to occur at Yellowstone within the month of January 2019. From Seismic Station, YDD. This is unfiltered, even though this is a broadband station again, magnitude 3.0, 9.4 kilometers in depth, excuse me. A typical high frequency volcano tectonic earthquake, except with dominant frequencies remaining below 15 hertz. It was not a low frequency earthquake, but it did have dominant lower frequencies. Here we are at the GPS deformation stations for Yellowstone Caldera. Shows the Caldera boundary, it's very helpful to know. Again. Shoshone Lake and Lewis Lake, where that most recent swarm occurred, 
is right inside the caldera boundary actually and the magma chamber is actually perfectly right in this area somewhat right here i believe the resurgent dome is right in this area somewhere and then up here as well but i don't want to focus on that right now i want to go to lkwy so again this is the deformation chart for the northern tip of yellowstone lake at station lkwy now when seeing these blue charts please keep in mind that the top chart, which says east, shows east-west horizontal deformation. The middle chart, which says north, shows north-south horizontal deformation. And the final chart at the bottom right here that says up shows vertical deformation, in other words, uplift or subsidence. Again, the top two are horizontal, and the last one at the bottom that says up is vertical. Although all three directions are very important to understand how the ground is shifting, the one to primarily watch is the vertical chart at the bottom right here. Sadly, we can see the data stream has possibly ended, guys. This is most likely due to the fact that station LKWY has been down for some time and may actually be connected to the deformation instrument. I hope they get it back online, but you can see on the vertical chart the uplift subsidence pattern is confusing. Look at that. And it almost looks like it is remaining at the same level. Altogether, the vertical chart from top to bottom shows a total of 0.3 meters since about 2004. Let's go to seismic, or sorry, excuse me, GPS station OFW2 right here. Again, top two horizontal, bottom is vertical. Again, this is where the Upper Geyser Basin is. That's where this station is located near Old Faithful. Here it seems the data stream is uninterrupted and is still ongoing. We see it as likely subsidence is continuing to be recorded on this station. However, it is quite hard to tell. But if uplift is starting again, it has yet to be accurately seen. The north-south chart doesn't show much at all. And same goes for the east-west chart. If uplift starts again, which I truly believe will happen in the next two years at the max, then it will show greatly on these stations, just like the last two periods of uplift did. Here's the first period of uplift that we recorded since 2004, started at about 2005, went all the way up, peaked at about 2010, slowly but surely went down with a few bumps here and there. Then at about 2014, it started to skyrocket once again with having, looks like, a little bit more uplift than the last episode. 2014, 2015, there were many low frequency events and low frequency tremor detected at Yellowstone. Uh, they weren't that big, but it almost seemed like it, the seismic stations were recording the magma chamber refilling. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but I'm just saying that's just one of my theories. Because the background microseisms on many of the stations in 2014-2015 have much uh, interesting low frequencies, but not too low. So I don't know what they are. I don't know. Uh, but again, looks like subsidence is occurring, but it, it's unknown. We haven't been at this level, though. Since about, let's see, all the way over, since about 2007. We haven't had this low of subsidence since 2007. So again, that is one of the reasons I believe uplift will start again, at least in the next two years at the max. Again, the vertical chart at the bottom shows a total range of 0 0.25 meters from bottom to top. Now let's go to WLWY, just northeast of Yellowstone Lake. If it'll open, come on, buddy boy. Okay, remember, top two are horizontal. Let's look at the vertical, showing uplift or subsidence. Again, the top two horizontal deformation charts are not showing much of a change. However, it seems like there's a slight spike, or should I say drop, in subsidence right here, meaning the ground barely sank, just around less than a centimeter or so. I don't think that measurement I just said is accurate, but I'm just saying it was a very, very, very small dip in subsidence. However, could it be related to the January 6, 2019 rapid fire swarm that struck very near where the station resides? I don't know. You be the judge. The total range of the vertical deformation chart is 0.45 meters from bottom to top. And last but certainly not least, we have NRWY. And here is an RWY in the Norse Geyser Basin near where Steamboat Geyser resides. As before, it does seem like the uplift here has stopped somewhat. See that? Could the increased uplift have been caused by a large influx in hydrothermal fluids preparing for the many steamboat eruptions? I am theorizing that Steamboat Geyser, due to the large quantity and size of the eruptions, has its own hydrothermal chamber. Kind of like a volcano with its own magma chamber, right? It will be interesting to see where this leads. Again, the uplift has paused, but I am expecting caldera-wide uplift to start again in the next two years at the max. 
That is just a projection, and it could be wrong, but again, I am expecting it. I base it off of the past few years of seismicity and the past few decades of uplift subsidence patterns. In total, the vertical chart here shows 0.25 meters from bottom to top. Next, let's move on to another very potentially dangerous supervolcano that, in my opinion, may be closer to an eruption than Yellowstone is. However, that can change very quickly. Here we are at the Long Valley Supervolcanic Complex. There were 354 reported earthquake events during the month of January 2019. You could tell, as usual, that most of the seismicity occurred under the southern half of the caldera. Here, let me turn on satellite. I like to keep on grayscale because it's really hard to see the earthquakes on any other type when it's like a month old. But you can see the caldera rim is right there. Usually it occurs on the southern half right there. So we turn on grayscale again. Again, most of the seismicity occurred under the southern half of the caldera with much more seismicity spreading out to the south, to the west, and to the southeast as well. There is even a little lonely earthquake all the way up here. These earthquakes are obviously being caused by local tectonic activity and also magmatic activity just below the surface. There was actually a severe magma intrusion event in the late 90s at Long Valley and Mammoth Mountain, even heightened degassing that killed many, many trees. According to the seismicity, it seems to be more active than Yellowstone. However, upon closer inspection, it appears reporting for Long Valley is a little better than for Yellowstone. So the reported earthquake counts could kind of throw you off, but still I believe Long Valley does have a little bit higher seismicity than Yellowstone does per month. Now the largest reported event for January 2019 was a magnitude 3.3 earthquake at 3.1 kilometers in depth on January 12th, 2019 at 414 UTC all the way south down here. Although it may be connected to Long Valley's processes, I like to use earthquakes that are a little bit closer to the volcano in question for the following plots. So we will use this one right here. It was magnitude 3.2 at 2.2 kilometers in depth, reportedly felt by three people on January 21st at 1822 UTC. For your convenience, here are the seismograms, spectrograms, spectra plots for the most recent largest earthquake to occur at Long Valley Supervolcano within the month of January. You can see it's a normal high range frequency uh, volcano tectonic earthquake, so nothing too crazy. It did have a pretty long tail that lasted a few minutes, but other than that, it did have dominant frequencies below 10 hertz, with of course some weaker frequencies going above that, but still a normal volcano tectonic earthquake, magnitude 3.2 at 2.2 kilometers in depth. Here we have the GPS deformation instruments for Long Valley Super Volcano. Let's click P639 real quick. Again, when viewing this blue three chart image, the top chart shows east-west horizontal deformation, the middle chart shows north-south horizontal deformation, and the bottom chart shows vertical deformation, in other words, uplift or subsidence. It looks like uplift has stalled. Notice that of, uh, as of the past few months, actually. However, of the most recent data, we see a battle taking place between uplift and subsidence. The war is on, and who will win? I have to say I am placing my bet on uplift. I bet it'll win just because of the sheer amount of magma down there, guys. Remember, Long Valley already likely contains enough magma to produce a super eruption if it erupted at full potential today. There is no sign of that yet, of course. However, that can change very quickly, so we must keep an eye on both Yellowstone and Long Valley. The top two horizontal charts, north and east, show the ground is steadily moving towards the southwest. Coincidentally, the southwest section of Long Valley Caldera is where we see a lot of the seismicity. For the vertical deformation chart showing uplift and subsidence, we see a total of 0.08 meters from bottom to top. Although I believe Long Valley is closer to an eruption than Yellowstone is, Yellowstone still sees much greater uplift than Long Valley does. Now let's go back. Let's go to CA99, which is right here. Let's click on it. All right, here we have the GPS deformation station CA99. Now, contrary to the previous station I showed, this one shows a much larger data stream going all the way back to about 2001 instead of March 2014 like we saw in the previous station. It seems right around 2011 is when Long Valley started to see increased, almost constant uplift patterns. The top two horizontal charts are still showing the ground is steadily moving towards the southwest, just like the other GPS stations are showing in the area. For the vertical chart at the bottom, we see a total of 0.16 meters from the top of the chart to the bottom. 
Now here we're back and let's go to our DOM, which is pretty much right in the center of the caldera. Let's click on it. We see this chart started in March of 2014 and shows basically the same horizontal pattern here as well. Notice that barely going to the southwest. We also see the same recent battle and uplift in subsidence here as well. However, it seems this station is mainly showing uplift, so it is likely uplift will come out victorious, as it usually does for Long Valley. For the vertical chart here, we see a total of 0.12 meters from bottom to top. Here we have the Newberry Caldera Volcano, which resides in central Oregon. Let me turn on the satellite view just so you can see it real fast, and then I'll turn it back. And there's Newberry Caldera. This whole area is actually very volcanic. There are many other smaller volcanoes. You can see some lava flows here as well. But this is the Newberry Caldera right here. It's a very large volcano in central Oregon. Let's go back to grayscale. We see only five reported earthquake events. It is likely this count is close to accurate since I have been vigorously searching for more low frequency earthquakes at Newberry since the increase in low frequency events at the end of 2018. There have been a few unreported low frequency events, especially during the day of the largest reported earthquake, but they do not seem to be increasing, but could be remaining at previous levels. Again, you can see the five of them. There's one right here, one right here and three right here. If you don't already know, I have a page already dedicated to all of the recent low frequency earthquakes to occur at Newberry Caldera. Of course, this page is for all Cascade volcanoes, but Newberry has been the only one in the Cascade range experiencing an obvious increase in low frequency events the past few years. Some were reported and some were even removed by PNSN from their catalog, even though they truly were low frequency earthquakes. All you got to do is come to my website, link is below in the description box right under my email address, hover over Seismic Events 2 drop down menu and click Cascade Volcanoes Low Frequency Events. I have many plots on this page. So all they reported was a negative magnitude 0.1 earthquake, a 0.1 magnitude earthquake, two 0.2s, and the largest reported event which occurred north of the caldera was a magnitude 0.3 at 1.8 kilometers in depth. This occurred again just north of Newberry on January 2nd, 2019 at 510 UTC. For your convenience, here are the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots of the largest reported earthquake for Newberry caldera for January 2019. The first event that you see on the seismogram and spectrogram plots here and here this is the same event right here, is the magnitude 0.3 at 1.8 kilometers in depth. However, using multiple stations, I was able to confirm this microquake here at the end should have been reported too. Heck, it is even bigger than the magnitude 0.3. I don't know what magnitude or depth it would be, but this may be the largest event of the month. However, I doubt that since there were a few other events throughout this month that were not reported, which were actually stronger than a magnitude 0.3, but I don't know. Oh, well, again, there could be some more unreported low frequency events for Newberry, but they aren't increasing crazily, though. I will let you guys know if it does do that. Here we are at the GPS stations for Newberry Caldera. Let's go to CPCO. Now, again, this is a different type of GPS chart, one that I do not like as much as the blue ones. The yellow line is vertical, in other words, uplift subsidence. Blue is east-west, and green is north-south. I have showed these in many of my recent updates, and there has been no major changes as of late. To save on time, I will not be showing any more GPS deformation charts in this video. However, I will if there is a change. But if you don't believe me, or you'd like to see it yourself, all you have to do is go to volcanoes.usgs.gov, Select a volcano of interest, click monitoring once on its page, and use the settings on the right of the map to select GPS stations. GPS stations, at least so far, are always marked by a blue star. Now here we are at one of the most infamous Pacific Northwest volcanoes, Mount Rainier, which adds a beautiful but potentially deadly backdrop to the Seattle skyline. There have been only 10 reported earthquake events for Rainier during the month of January 2019. It seems the past six months or so have seen a dramatic decrease in seismicity for pretty much every volcano in the Cascade Range. How can that be? Is this a good thing? I doubt it. But I have no clue what will happen next or where, so we will just have to wait and see. Of course, no swarming happened this month, and most of the seismicity occurred under the strata volcano itself, with a few earthquakes spread out to the west in the West Rainier Seismic Zone. It is likely most of the time that the earthquakes that occur in this zone to the west are caused by tectonic stresses rather than volcanic. However, you never know. 
and increased magma supply to the chamber, even years before an eruption, would cause an increase in seismicity both under Rainier itself and in this West Rainier seismic zone as pressure starts to build and the ground starts to rise just a little bit. The largest reported earthquake for January 2019 was a magnitude 1.6 and 9.5 kilometers in depth on January 23rd, 2019 at 2340 UTC. Although this event was the largest and this event was the second largest, they both occurred in the west seismic zone. And I like to use events that are closer to the volcano in question for the plots below. To do this, we have to go to the third largest earthquake, which was a magnitude 1.2 and negative 0.4 kilometers in depth on January 12, 2019 at 2341 UTC. Remember, 0.0, .0 kilometers in depth itself is sea level, so you must always equate the ele elevation excuse me, into reported depths. Although it occurred at 0.4 kilometers above sea level, Mount Rainier is much taller than that, so it probably occurred within the first quarter vertical section of the stratovolcano. For your convenience, here are the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots for the largest earthquake to occur at Mount Rainier Stratovolcano within the month of January 2019. This earthquake was a typical VT, volcano tectonic earthquake. Typical high frequencies. However, notice this strange signal here. You notice that right there? It started right when the earthquake started. Now, it seems artificial in nature since it is monochromatic, meaning it contains basically one frequency. The frequency for this possible artificial signal is about 22 hertz, and you can see it's almost very monochromatic. Although it cries artificial in nature, it is notable that it started right when the earthquake did. So, I don't know. It was very, very strange. And here we are at the volcano that gave my mother a very bad day on May 18th, 1980, Mount St. Helens. This volcano pummeled my mother's house with inches of ash and even rained ash on my dad's car in Denver, Colorado. The main Mount St. Helens eruption ejected 0.29 cubic miles of ash compared to the possible 140 or even 240 cubic miles Long Valley Caldera could possibly eject during its next eruption. For the month of January 2019, we see only eight reported earthquake events. Let me turn on grayscale. You can see them right here which, to no surprise, is once again lower than the previous month's totals. A few events occurred under Helens itself, with barely any events spread out to the southwest, south, and east. What the heck is going on, guys? Even Mount St. Helens is going quiet, and this is really quiet for the most active volcano in the continental United States. Why are all of the Cascade Range volcanoes becoming quiet over the past six months or so? I wouldn't worry too much if only one or two volcanoes did it, but all of the Cascade volcanoes? I don't know, guys. I really don't like to worry much since being a worry ward is overrated, but to me, this shows pressure, excuse me, pressure could be building and shifting, but by how much and to where? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. However, it has been almost 40 years since a volcanic eruption and about 15 years or so since any type of volcanic activity occurred within the continental United States, so I bet we will see some type of volcanic activity somewhere in the Cascade Range within the next two decades at the max. I may be wrong, but that is how I feel. The largest reported event for January was a magnitude 1.3 earthquake at 6.4 kilometers in depth on January 29th, 2019 at 342 UTC. This one occurred close to Mount St. Helens, yes, just to the south. However, I would like to use the second largest event since it actually occurred under the volcano itself. It was a magnitude 0 .2, 0 0.8 excuse me, and negative 0 0.8 kilometers in depth. Remember, 0.0, .0 kilometers in depth exactly is sea level. It struck on January 25th at 2051 UTC. For your convenience, here are the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots of the largest earthquake to occur at the Mount St. Helens Stratovolcano for the month of January 2019. Actually, the, the largest event occurred just to the south, but this is the largest for the volcano itself. This event occurred under the volcano itself, again, probably halfway between sea level and the top of the dome inside the crater. It was a typical high-frequency volcano tectonic earthquake. We should be seeing more of these, but lately it has been very quiet, guys. Again, I have to say, why the heck? Are all of the Cascade Range volcanoes going nearly silent? Here we are at the Mount Hood volcano in northern Oregon, which straddles the border between Washington and Oregon. Before I start, I just want to put it out there that a new fault line of sorts has been discovered cutting through Mount Hood. 
A link will be posted below in the description box under resources. However, it will probably be near the end of the resources list. They think this newly discovered fault could trigger a magnitude 7.2 earthquake at best. This is crazy for any stratovolcano. If that were to happen, it could really damage the stratovolcano, guys, not only geologically, but volcanically as well. Who knows what that type of earthquake could do to the magma chamber below. Personally, I think it would kickstart a pre-eruption process that could lead to the emptying of the chamber below. Again, this is just preliminary, but it is quite freaky that a fault line like this rests under a stratovolcano this large. Now, for the month of January 2019, there have been only three reported earthquake events that occurred right here. Let me turn off grayscale just so you can see them better. Although the Cascade Range is going eerily silent, this volcano seems to be staying around the same levels. It actually is usually never that active. The largest event of January occurred directly under Mount Hood, as well as the other two events, and was reportedly a magnitude 1.8 earthquake at 3.1 kilometers in depth on January 29th at 5.45 UTC. For your convenience, here are the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots for the largest earthquake to occur at Mount Hood Stratovolcano within the month of January 2019. You can see it's a typical volcano tectonic earthquake. Didn't last too, too long. Did have kind of a longer tail than usual, but it's still normal er, normal earthquake, excuse me, with dominant frequencies below 15 hertz with weaker frequencies, of course, going above that. Here is Mount Shasta, which resides just south of the California-Oregon border. If you have ever driven from Southern Oregon into California using Interstate 5, you already know the volcano is very large. For the month of January 2019, there was only one reported earthquake event. Of course, there could have been a couple tiny events here and there that weren't reported, but this is pretty much it. Although most of the volcanoes of the Cascade Range have been going virtually silent, this volcano is pretty much silent to begin with. I really don't see any type of eruption occurring at Mount Shasta for a very, very long time. However, magma is always the driving force behind excuse me, volcanic eruptions, and as proven by recent eruptions worldwide, magma does have a mind of its own, and this status could change at any moment. Always be prepared, and always have a plan while hoping for the best. The largest and only reported earthquake event was magnitude 0.4 at 11.1 .1 kilometers in depth, just under the base, you see that right there, that little tiny blue dot right where my mouse is, to the southeast. It occurred on January 20th, 2019 at 2247 UTC. For your convenience, here are the seismogram, spectrogram, spectra plots of the largest and only earthquake to occur under Mount Shasta for the month of January 2019. Again, it was a magnitude 0.4 at 11.1 .1 kilometers in depth on January 20th. These stations in this area are not too great for detecting earthquakes, but they did detect this one. However, it barely appears on seismic stations due to its low amplitude versus its larger depth. It contains mid-range frequencies, not really surpassing 16 Hz, and this is most likely another normal volcano tectonic earthquake, though it's a little bit deeper than what I would expect around here. And here we are at the last volcano in the update, Lassen Peak Volcanic Center in Northern California. Again, Glacier Peak in Washington State will be added to the update once new instruments are installed. This is a volcano which resides in Northern California, just 60 miles southeast of Mount Shasta. For the month of January 2019, 16 earthquakes have been reported, which is slightly less than last month's total and less than the previous month as well. About half of the events occurred under Lassen Volcanic Center, you can see a few right here, with a few spread out to the west and northwest, and also down to the southeast. The largest seismic event here, let me turn on grayscale just so you can see all the earthquakes. The largest seismic event reported for January 2019 was a magnitude 1.7 earthquake at 3.3 kilometers in depth right under Lassen Peak. It struck on January 13th, 2019 at 716 UTC. Now during this day, there is an event that I would like to analyze real quick. I will quickly show the magnitude 1.7 first, and then I will show the interesting, supposedly unreported event. It was not a quarry blast, it was not a rock fall. It appeared on many, many neighboring stations, and it was not reported. It also contained dominant low frequencies, and somewhat appeared to be some type of tornado event, which is usually caused by volcanic processes below the surface, but that wouldn't be too much surprise to see that at Lassen Peak, since Lassen Peak is, uh, it's pretty volcanic, guys. It's got some active hot springs and geothermal features, so it's very, very active. 
Here we are at station LSI in the NC network, which I believe is the closest station to this seismic event. Now I really quick want to take a look at this right here and also take a look at this right here. Look at that. Look at that tail, guys. Now first, let me go down. Now here is the reported 1.7. Let me just show this real fast. Okay, let me zoom in like so. Again, this was a magnitude 1.7 earthquake at 3.3 kilometers in depth on January 13th, 2019 at about 716 UTC right under Lassen Peak itself. Here are the spectrogram plots, spectrogram plots, sorry. Here's the seismogram plot, waveform plot. Let me zoom in on here just so you can get a very zoomed in look at this earthquake, normal volcano tectonic event. And let's go take a look at the dominant frequencies. Yeah, definitely high frequency VT, volcano tectonic earthquake. Now let's turn log power lock frequency back on. There was another unreported earthquake just right after, right here, but most likely an aftershock. You can see it right there on the spectrogram. Very weak, very, very weak. You can see it occurred just about a minute or two after the 1.7. I'm gonna say this is probably a uh, 0.1 it only goes to about 200 amplitude count at the maximum these look like surface noise not seeing much else but then check this out let me go to spectrogram and zoom out what the heck is that to me i first thought it was some type of quarry blast or a teleseism or something it was neither of those guys it just shows very weird on surrounding stations I highly doubt it was a quarry blast or something. Look at this. Look at the waveforms, guys. It almost looks like there's also a secondary increase in energy right there, possibly showing maybe there were two events. You notice that? Possibly two events. Let's check out the dominant frequency range of this. But first, here, I'll go back. Let me go forward. See this right down here? Look at this weird, weird event. Doesn't even look like an earthquake or I don't even know what that is. But I have a guess. I think this is a rock fall. This looks just like what rock falls look like with mid range to high range frequencies, emergent. Yeah, I think this is a rock fall. This is what they look like. So we know it's not a rock fall. This thing is not a rock fall or a quarry blast. I highly doubt there's a quarry blast. Nothing was reported for this time period too. And it actually traveled quite far. So again, let's zoom in. Notice how long the tail is, by the way. Hold on, let me try to cancel that, whoops. It starts at about 936.29 UTC and ends all the way to 939.51. Obviously, the earthquake ends right about here or so, but the tail extends for a long time, multiple minutes, guys. Very long-lasting and does appear to be some type of tornado, which is usually caused by magmatic processes, but I don't know for sure. Definitely doesn't look like any type of quarry blast I've ever seen in my life. Let's check out the dominant frequencies of this just real fast. Dominant frequencies below 5 hertz, so let's turn log frequency on to get a better look. Wow, dominant frequencies below 2.3 hertz and above 1.09 hertz. Definitely is a low frequency event, but is this a low frequency earthquake or a quarry blast? I doubt this is a minor quarry blast like I just said like 10,000 times repeating myself. Because if this is a tornado, if it is, if this is at an actual seismic event, this is the first one I've ever discovered. So I'm pretty excited about it. It's pretty interesting. And so, yeah, that's pretty much it for Lassen Peak. Again, this was the magnitude 1.7 at 3.3 kilometers in depth. All right, let's move on. All right, guys, I know I said I wasn't going to show any more GPS charts unless there was a change. Well, there was a change. Let's go to P666 at Lassen Volcanic Center. We see right here, again, when viewing these blue charts, the top two show horizontal deformation and the bottom shows uh, vertical deformation, which is uplift subsidence. The volcano has seen some major deformation events in the past few decades, with some obviously shown here, as well as on neighboring GPS stations. However, lately, it seems to be somewhat calm. There was a pattern, seems like, like every six I'm going to say maybe every three to six months there was a, an uplift pattern, but it was supposed to do it right here at about March 2018. Didn't happen. Completely skipped it. So is it possible we are about to see another one right now? Yes, I do think so. And look at the most recent data stream. Looky, looky. It seems a little bit of uplift did occur around late January 2019 or so. 
I don't know where this is headed, but I will give you guys an additional heads up if anything changes majorly. If not, you will get more info during the next update, or you could just monitor this stuff yourself, guys, using the website volcanoes.usgs.gov. By the way, Lassen Peak is the only other volcano to erupt violently during the 20th century in the continental United States. Only Lassen Peak and Mount St. Helens erupted during that century. If you wish to see pictures of the 1915 Lassen Peak eruption, yes, they amazingly exist. And there's a lot of them. All you have to do is search 1915 Lassen Peak on Google, and you will be surprised as to what you come across. Holy crap, look at how hard it is snowing at Yellowstone right now. Look at how much snow that is, and it's still not sticking to Old Faithful. Old Faithful is really hot. You can see there's a little line right here. I think that's the stream from the Old Faithful eruptions whenever the water comes out. I don't know, but there's feet and feet and feet of snow there. We almost have as much snow as Yellowstone does, but we still don't come close. A lot of the snow is melting now, but... They say there's a chance for snow pretty much every day for the next three weeks or something like that. So, But I think it is getting warmer and it's melting, so my kids are getting a little sad. Again, we are back at the wonderful Upper Geyser Basin, home to the infamous Old Faithful Geyser at Yellowstone National Park and Caldera. This is the new webcam that they were installing. It looks great and appears to be in the same area, so there wasn't that much of a change. Well, it seems, of course, that Yellowstone and Long Valley supervolcanoes have the highest seismicity counts out of all the volcanoes I showed for the month of January 2019. Of course, concerning activity at any of these volcanoes will warn its own video and its own blog post on my website, especially if increased deformation is spotted in conjunction with increased seismicity, almost a sure sign a magma chamber is growing restless for an approaching eruption or major intrusion event. For those who watch my videos, please go check out my website. My site is helpful in conjunction with my videos, and it already contains a great many pages with hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots and images for many, many different events at many different volcanoes. I will also be able to upload more information on there than if I was only making YouTube videos. So if you like, please monitor many pages on my website. You never know when a new thing will come out. The link to it is in the description box below, right under my email address. The next monthly update will be for February 2019, which will be uploaded a few days after the month has ended. I know this one was late, guys, but I usually try to get my updates out there around the 5th of every month. I hope to someday become more educated in regards to volcanoes and earthquakes. And I do hope to become a volcanic seismologist, but I am already equipped to give you guys a heads up if concerning activity may ever rear its ugly head. Any support would be amazing, guys. And no, I'm not talking about money. I can't stand the people who monitor volcanoes and stuff who ask for money. I mean, it's not a bad thing. I'm not saying it's bad, but I, I'm never really going to do that, you know, unless I'm really in a big rut for money. I, You know, I'm talking about personal support for my viewers, guys. And I want to thank you all for all you guys' support. And keep your heads up and please be prepared with, at the very least, three days of food and water per person within your household. Please double that per child that you have under the age of 12, just in case. After all, when disaster strikes, you can never be too prepared. If any mistakes have occurred or I'm wrong about something, please feel free to let me know below. I'm a chill guy that is actually okay with constructive criticism. Sadly, the world, and especially YouTube, has too big of an ego right now to think constructive criticism is even a good thing, especially many specific YouTubers. This is why I rarely ever watch YouTube videos anymore, guys. I simply rely on the data for my research while making YouTube videos and blog posts so people can enjoy and learn from the research I spend so much time on. But always test everything yourself, guys. I will always stand for the truth no matter where it leads. Why? Because the truth is considered hate or fear to those who hate or fear the truth. God bless. Please stay safe and let me know what you think. Many more pages and blog posts have been added to my site, so don't forget it. Ben Ferriolo, signing off. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow.